All right. So chapter 13 deals with ethers and epoxides, thiols and sulfides. Um, in this class, we mostly just talk about the ethers and epoxides. You have to know what a thiol and a sulfide are, but we don't do a lot of that chemistry. So you would remember that an ether is when we have an oxygen flanked by two carbons, and an epoxide is when we have a three-membered ring that has an oxygen in it. You would have seen that when we took an alkene. So if we took an alkene like this, and then we treated it with MCPBA or a peroxy acid, we saw that it gave us, you know, an, epo oops, an epoxide. So we went over that before. Um, uh, epoxides, sometimes we also call them oxiranes. So sometimes we call them oxiranes. So I'll use that sometimes. And then a thiol, you should know a thiol is the sulfur analog of an alcohol. And a sulfide is the sulfur analog analog of an ether. So there you go. So that's what this chapter covers. But again, 95% of it, or maybe 98% of it, will be t covering ethers and epoxides. All right. So introduction to ether. Again, you guys know what an ether is. It's an oxygen bound to two carbon groups. But remember, they are alkyl groups, okay? They can be aryl groups as well, okay? They can be vinyl groups, but they can't be an acyl group. So what does that mean? All it means is this, is that if you see an oxygen and it's flanked by two carbons, but one of them is part of a carbonyl, then that is not an, an ether, is it, right? You should recognize that as being ester. Remember, when we look at functional groups, we have to look at what we call the 30,000 foot view. So sometimes when we're learning the subject, we might be tempted to say, oh, well, this is a ketone and this is an ether. No, you have to look at the entire thing and say, this is an ester. So don't mix up an ester and an ether, they're two different things, all right? So where do you find ethers in your everyday life? Well, you can see they're all over the place here. If you've ever heard of the drug Prozac, it's an antidepressant. It's kind of an interesting drug because it's got fluorine in it. You don't see a lot of drugs with fluorine, but you see that in Prozac, we have an ether, right? So there's an ether in uh, Prozac and vitamin E. There's an ether in vitamin E right here in morphine, which is named after Morpheus, the god of dreams has an ether in it as well. So we see ether, uh, ethers rather in many naturally occurring compounds and many synthetic compounds as well. So morphine, it's, it's an opioid, so it's a naturally occurring compound. And then something like um, Prozac would be a, a synthetic compound. Now, when it comes to naming ether, ethers, uh, there's a couple of ways of doing it. There's the common way of naming them and there's the systematic way. But remember, there's no, when we talk about common and systematic, systematic, they're both accepted by IUPAC. So both of these are accepted by IUPAC. It's not this. Sometimes people will think systematic means IUPAC. No, they're both acceptable by the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. And common names are used a lot for ethers because a lot of times we talk about simple ethers. And so if you've forgotten your R groups, like methyl, ethyl, propyl, isopropyl, butyl, terbutyl, secbutyl, um, you, you need to remember those because they're going to come up in this chapter. So if it's an R group that you know, okay, if it's an R group that you already have memorized, so an alkyl or an aryl group, you have to name that. You organize the alkyl groups in alphabetical order, and then you follow it up with the word ether. So if we take a look at this ether, we see we have a methyl group on one side, ethyl group on the ether, ethyl group on the other. The letter E comes before M in the alphabet, so ethyl, methyl, ether. The next one, you have a terbutyl group on one side, a methyl on the other. Remember, we ignore the prefix tert, but we alphabetize by B and M, so it's terbutyl, methyl, ether. This is kind of a funny compound, terbutyl, methyl, ether, because the acronym that chemists use, and don't throw anything at me, is MTBE, which is methyl terbutyl ether, which is the wrong, incorrect way of, of, of naming it according to this slide. However, uh, I think that historically some ethers were named according to the size of the alkyl group, so it went smallest to largest, but we're always going to follow alphabetical order, okay? So we'll do it the way that it's shown here on the slide and not, not this way, okay? So don't worry about that. All right, now, what if you have an R group that that you can't recognize, if it's something that's really big. Now, obviously, I think you could all identify a pentyl group, right? Five carbons in a straight chain. But let's imagine you couldn't, okay? In that case, what you do 
is you look at the larger R group and you call that, that, that your parent chain. So you see that you have five carbons in here. So it's some kind of pentane. And what you do is you name the smaller portion as an alkoxy group. So we have an ethyl and an oxygen, so it's an ethoxy, right? If it was CH3O, it would be methoxy. If it was isopropyl with an oxygen, we'd call it isopropoxy, propoxy. If it was, you know, a tert-butyl with an oxygen, we'd call it tert-butoxy, so on and so forth. Okay, I won't list them all. So the way we would name this is we say we have an ethoxy group and it's on our pentane and it's on carbon number one. So we say one, we call this compound one ethoxy pentane, one ethoxy pentane. So again, the um, systematic names and the common names are both acceptable by IUPAC. So let's see if we can name these compounds. Let's uh, start with the first one and we'll give it a common name first, okay? So could anybody name either of the alkyl groups on here? We have this one, and we have this one over here. Anybody could name either of those alkyl groups? Yeah, we have an ethyl, and once uh, the green one is an ethyl, and the one in blue, what would that one be? Isopropyl. Absolutely, there you go. So we'll put them in alphabetical order. Remember, we don't ignore the, or we um, do not ignore the prefix iso. So it's going to be ethyl isopropyl ether. Okay. Now, if we named it according to the systematic way, we'd look for the longest carbon chain, which is three carbons. So this is some kind of propane. And then we have an ethoxy group on carbon number, oops, carbon number. One, two, three. So it's on carbon number two. So you'd call this two ethoxy, two ethoxy propane. Either one is perfectly fine. Okay, for the next one, we're going to use, um, only going to use the uh, systematic way because there's a chiral center in there. Did anybody uh, evaluate already what the chirality is here? Is this an R stereo center or an S stereo center? Maybe I'll zoom in so you can see here. Could anybody tell me is this R or S? Remember your hydrogen is in the back. Yeah, it's S, isn't it? Thanks, Erica. All right, you go from one to two to three. So you go like this, so yes, it's an S stereocenter. So if we look at our longest carbon chain, it has one, two, three carbons. So we've got a, a two chloro, one ethoxy um, propane. So we'll put them S, right? Because that's our stereo, um, stereochemical configuration. Then it's some kind of propane. So what did I say? It's a two chloro. I put chloro first because C comes before E in the alphabet. So two chloro, one ethoxy propane, propane, like that. All right. The next one, uh, our parent in this case, does anybody remember the name of this fancy six membered ring here? I know you know what it is. What do you call that ring? Yeah, benzene, right? So it's a benzene. So we have a benzene ring, absolutely. So we're going to number it to give the substituents the lowest possible number. So one, two, three, four. So we have a two, four dichloro, one ethoxy benzene. So we'll put here two, four dichloro, one ethoxy benzene. Like that. There you go. All right. As we say in Scottish. Good. Okay. So a little bit about the structure and properties of ethers. Okay. So you should remember from organic chemistry one that if we have an ether and we draw it like this, there's nothing wrong with drawing the ether that way. But what is the molecular geometry of this oxygen? Right. Its molecular geometry is bent right? Because it has a steric number of four. So we have the two R groups where we have a bond angle that's close to 109.5 degrees. And then we have one lone pair going in the back and one coming out in front like that. So the oxygen is sp3 hybridized, just like the oxygen in a water molecule. So if we go to an alcohol, we see that 
it is also bent, okay? Bond angle close to 109.5 degrees, but with an ether, you notice that are approximately 109.5. Why would the bond angle of dimethyl ether be a little bit bigger? Well, you can see why. It's because you have two methyl groups. They provide more steric hindrance, so they push each other a little bit further away, and we end up with a wider bond angle. Now, you don't need to memorize the bond angles. All I would ask is that you know that the bond angle is going to be... I'll put here... I'll change this. I'll flip it to greater fix that. Greater than 109.5 degrees, that's good enough for me. Okay, As long as you know the bond angle is going to be a little bigger than tetrahedral because you have those two groups that are going to push each other apart. So what is the molecular geometry of an ether? It is bent. What is the hybridization of the oxygen of an ether? It is sp3. All right. What is the bond angle of an ether? It is greater than 109.5 degrees. Give me a, everybody with me on that. Thumbs up. Yes. No. Toaster as we say in French. All right, good. Now we're really cooking with gas. Well, what's another principle that you should remember from general chemistry, right, would be hydrogen bonding. So if we think of an alcohol, alcohol alcohols have high boiling points. Why? Because of hydrogen bonding. However, if I look at an ether, can an ether participate in hydrogen bonding in a pure sample? So let's say I have just two ethers together, okay? Let's say I have you know, this ether and this ether, okay? Can I have... Let's say I have this ether and this ether, just pure, a pure bottle of ethers, okay? A pure bottle of diethyl ether. Can I have hydrogen bonding between these two molecules that I've drawn here? Two ethers. Can there be hydrogen bonding between two ethers? No, thank you, good. Because yes, there's oxygen, but there's no hydrogen attached to it. So is there a dipole? Let me ask you another question then. Is there a dipole in an ether? Are ethers polar? Is an ether polar? Yes, absolutely, isn't it, Kristen, right? Because you have a dipole going this way and a dipole going this way. And so the net dipole of an ether is going to be going this way and this way. So ethers experience dipole-dipole forces, dipole-dipole forces between each other. And, of course, they experience London forces. But what if I put an ether in an alcohol? So here I have an ether... And here I have an alcohol. Can I have hydrogen bonding between the two? Yes. Okay. Because the lone pair, we call that the hydrogen bond acceptor. The hydrogen that participates in um, a hydrogen bond, this is the H bond donor. Okay. But remember, there's no bond between hydrogen and oxygen in an ether. So an ether can only act as a hydrogen bond acceptor. So yes, an ether can participate in hydrogen bonding if it's in water or in alcohol, but if you have a pure ether, there's no hydrogen bonding. You'd only have dipole-dipole forces and London forces. Good. All right, so ethers, again, and I'm repeating myself, cannot hydrogen bond among themselves. They have dipoles, right? They do have a dipole, but the reason why their boiling points are so much lower than, of, lower than alcohols of comparable size why is because they only have dipole 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 forces. Again, an alcohol has hydrogen bonding, but an ether only has dipole dipole and of course London. And then if we go to an alkane, well that only has London forces. So even though all of these compounds have a similar molar mass, you see that the boiling point goes down. So we'll say here um, high boiling point, and down here, low boiling point, like that. So, now, what if we just compare a bunch of ethers, right, which all have dipole-dipole forces? You can imagine that the bigger that they get, the higher the boiling points are. Why? Because you have increased London forces, right? You have a higher surface area, and the more surface area you have, the greater interaction there's going to be, and so the more London forces there will be at play. And so you should know that as you go from a small ether 
to a large ether, we go from low boiling point to a high boiling point. I mean, you could, answer, could have answered this question without any of my help. I mean, this is just reviewing principles that you learn in general chemistry, really. Okay, so what are some other ethers that you might not have seen before? Well, I'm sure you've all seen diethyl ether. So if you have two ethyl groups, you would say diethyl. But this compound, sometimes we also call it ethyl ether. So if somebody says ethyl ether, everybody knows you're referring to diethyl ether. It's a very commonly used solvent. Um, the only um, drawback to something like diethyl ether is it's highly flammable. It has a high vapor pressure, so it vaporizes very easily. Uh, the next one is tetrahydrofuran. We call this THF. So THF. And THF is one of the most commonly used solvents in all of organic chemistry. In fact, I know that you guys haven't seen it a lot yet, but you know all those green yard reactions that we did? So if we hear green yard, you can do green yard reactions in ethers like diethyl ether, but a lot of green yard reactions are done in THF. And the reason why is because THF is so unreactive. Um, it's so unreactive that it makes a great solvent. And then 1,4-dioxane has a lot of purposes as well, but you can see that that's a diether. We have an ether here and an ether here in the compound. So again, what's another reason why these, uh, or what are the reasons why these make good solvents? So all of these are good solvents, right? Two things. First of all, they're quite unreactive, but the second thing is that they have a low boiling point. If you're like, well, what does it matter if it has a low or high boiling point? The lower the boiling point, the easier it is to remove the solvent. Once you get to a boiling point of 100 degrees with like something like water, it's actually really difficult to remove water from a reaction because water's boiling point is so high. So ethers have that advantage. So again, unreactive and uh, low boiling points. Now, if you're if you're you know if you haven't read the chapter yet and you're thinking about this word, if you're thinking about the word unreactive, you might be going, okay, if they're unreactive, how many reactions can there be of ethers? The answer is there's not an abundance. There aren't an abundance of reactions with ethers. Why? Because they're so stable, okay? There are things you can do with them. We can break them apart, but it takes a lot of force to break an ether apart. They are very, very stable. Now, section 13.4 about crown ethers, I'm just going to skip that flat out because you don't need it for this class. It's not tested on the ACS final, so don't worry about it. If you want to read it, I'll leave it as an FYI. Of course, you have access to the tech. Uh, you have access to it in the textbook. Now, let's get into how do you make an ether. So, let's say you wanted to make an ether. I'll just tell you right now, ethers are abundant and cheap. Okay, ethers are not expensive. But if you're wondering how is a solvent like diethyl ether, which you can buy in 55-gallon drums, probably. Okay, how do they make that? Well, it's actually a pretty clever way of, of making the solvent is they take ethanol, which again is abundant, okay? They just treat it with acid. So they put ethanol in acid, and what it does is it converts a poor leaving group into a great leaving group, and then another molecule of ethanol is gonna come along and do a nucleophilic attack, okay? We get a loss of leaving group, a proton transfer, and there you go, now you form diethyl ether. So this is a mechanism I expect you to know. So I'm gonna put a star by this one. I would expect you to be able to put this mechanism together. However, the problem with this reaction is that this method of just taking ethanol, or I'll just put alcohol plus acid, gives you an ether like that. I'd say the only problem with this reaction is that um, you can only use it to make symmetrical ethers. Okay, That means that both R groups on either side of the oxygen have to be identical. Let's say you wanted to make something like that compound, that ethyl isopropyl ether that we looked at earlier. You could not make it this way. You've got to have a different way to do it. All right, and we're going to discuss that. And the way that you would make an unsymmetrical ether is using a named reaction named after a guy named Williamson. So here's the Williamson ether synthesis. You know what's interesting about this reaction and that teaching it um, in chemistry 3111 is that... Um, you guys probably could have come up with this reaction or, you know, figured out the answer to, to what you would get from these reagents without me even presenting it, okay? So the Williamson ether is a two-step process, but it allows us to make any kind or a lot of kinds of 
um, asymmetrical ethers. So what happens in the first step is you take your alcohol and you treat it with sodium hydride. What do we know about sodium hydride? Is that it is a poor nucleophile, but it is a very strong base. So if it's a strong base, what does that mean? It means that after step one, we're going to end up with an alkoxide. Okay, so this is after step one. You see the mechanism down here at the bottom, right? The sodium hydride, the hydride ion removes the proton. You liberate hydrogen gas. You form H2 gas, which goes up the smokestack. It's not shown here, I don't think. Plus, you form your alkoxide. Now, the alkoxide is a really good nucleophile. So if you put it in the presence of a good electrophile, what's going to happen is it's going to attack it by an SN2 reaction that you see right here, and then you form an unsymmetrical or asymmetrical ether, okay, and a sodium salt, which is shown down here. There you go. There's the Williamson ether synthesis. So again, when do we use this? If we want to make an asymmetrical ether. However, there are limitations to this reaction. If you're wondering, what would the limitations be? I'll tell you what they are right here. Look at the second step. The second step is an SN2. What does that mean? It means what can we use for Rx, right? If it's an SN2 reaction, the Rx has to be methyl primary or secondary, right? If it's tertiary, you're just going to get elimination. That's all. So there are limitations to the Williamson ether synthesis. Now, even... Um, our textbook says it only works with primary and methyl. Now, we know that with a secondary, you can get some SN2, but we know that E2 is going to predominate. So for our purposes, what we're going to say is that secondary, we're not even going to use it for that, okay? Because you're mostly going to get E2. You would get some SN2. I know. I'm fully aware of that. But you're mostly going to get E2. So we're just going to stick with primary and methyl only. So again, First step, deprotonation. Second step, nucleophilic attack loss of leaving group. And there you go. So again, for chemistry 3111, our Rx is going to be either a primary or a methyl alkyl halide. Yes, you could get some substitution with a secondary, but you're mostly going to get elimination. So now, let's say you wanted to make this compound, which is actually tert butyl methyl ether, but you can see the acronym is MTBE, which is incorrect. But anyhow. There's two possibilities here, right? You can start with terbutyl alcohol from this side, okay, with this compound, or you could start with methanol from this side. So what's the correct answer? Well, there's only one right answer here, okay? If we were to take the, the terbutanol and we deprotonate it, we end up with, I'll use my red pen, okay? We end up with terbutoxide, which is a good nucleophile, but can we use methyl iodide in an SN2? The answer is yes, right? No problem. So that's a very good reaction, right? You put it in the presence of the methyl iodide, you get nucleophilic attack, loss of leaving group, and it's done. However, if you were to start with methanol, you might think, hey, this is a good strategy. I'll just deprotonate it. I'll make methoxide. But when you put that in the presence of tert butyl iodide, what's going to happen, right? This is a tertiary alkyl halide. I'll tell you what's going to happen is it's going to just do an elimination reaction where you're going to end up with an alkene, okay? It's not going to work. So give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the rationale. The main thing you have to remember is that in the second step, your electrophile has to be either a methyl alkyl halide or a primary alkyl halide. Tertiary definitely won't work. Okay, it's only going to give you elimination. There we go. Now, you guys probably remember oxymercuration, demercuration from way back in Chapter 8. Okay, you would have learned this in Chapter 8.6. We said first step was mercuric acid, uh, mercuric acetate in water, followed by sodium Borohydride. Okay, those are the conditions for oxymercuration, demercuration. You see them right here. So if we take uh, an alkene, we get um, a Markovnikov addition. So let's write that down. Actually, it's down here at the bottom, isn't it? This occurs with Markovnikov regioselectivity. So some genius that I would love to meet came up with a variation of this reaction and said, well, hold on. The water, right, the, this water molecule is what gets incorporated 
into the compound. So the person said, well, what if I changed it to an ether, or sorry, what if I changed it to an alcohol? Then on this side, I'd get ROH. So I would make an ether in the process. So if you're wondering what that looks like, let me show you. It showed right here. So again, I'm going to write here, smart. Whoever came up with this idea, okay? Very bright, okay? You say, well, I'll just use an alcohol instead of water, right? It's, it's a great solvent. It's going to work. It's going to work in a Markovnikov uh, fashion where the there the alkoxy part is going to add to the more substituted position okay so the rich are going to get richer in hydrogen it's the same old thing but now what have you made r o r you made an ether along the way so we're taking an old reaction but now instead of calling it so watch carefully oxymercuration demercuration gives you an alcohol Alkoxy mercuration demercuration gives you an ether. Okay, so there's a slight change. So it goes from oxy to alkoxy mercuration demercuration. Pretty close, I realize that, but there's a difference between the two. All right, so let's see if we could use the Williamson ether synthesis to synthesize um, these compounds. All right, so for the first one, I'm going to put a circle around this side and I'll put a circle around this side okay now remember the strategy was to take an alcohol to treat it with sodium hydride and then to treat it with some kind of alkyl halide like this and then that's going to give you r o r like this that's the williamson ether synthesis so for my let's do it this way for my alcohol would I use the side in red or the side in blue to make my out or to, for my starting alcohol? It's not a trick question or anything. Yeah, it's going to be the one in blue, right? Because if I think about the alkyl halide I'd get from this, use my blue pen, right? The alkyl halide from this would be a secondary alkyl halide, but the alkyl halide from this side would be a primary alkyl halide. So this, I'm going to want to be my Rx, and this part, I'm going to want to be my ROH. Exactly. So I'm going to start with isopropyl alcohol, treat it with sodium hydride. Then in the second step, I'm going to treat it with my primary alkyl, eh, alkyl halide like this, and that is going to give me the product in the end, okay? So if you're unsure as to why, again, what you're going to end up with after the first step is the isopropoxide ion, and that is going to do your SN2. Why? Because this is primary like that. Give me a thumbs up if that makes some sense to you. Everybody with me on that idea? Cha? All right, good. So now that we have that in mind, let me just erase some of the spinach here and let's try one more, okay? So what about the one at the bottom? If I circle, I don't know, this side in blue, that side of our ether, and if I circle all of this side in red, okay? Which side would I use for my alcohol? Would it be the side in red or the side in blue? My alcohol. For my alcohol. Anybody have an idea about that one? No? Okay. So if we were to use the one that's red, let's say we were to use the, the blue side as our alcohol. In that case, you would end up with a tertiary alkyl halide. If you were to use the red side as your alcohol, you would end up with a primary or a methyl halide. So the red side should be the one that uses your alcohol. So you're going to have your tertiary alcohol, treat that with sodium hydride. In the second step, you're going to treat that with methyl iodide or whatever, methyl bromide, methyl chloride, and then it's going to give you the final product, which is going to look like that. All right, there we go. Not too bad. 
Let's move on from here. It says identify the reagents that you would use to prepare each of the following using alkoxymercuration, demercuration. So same vein as our oxymercuration, demercuration. The change is this. I'll write it down over here. So step one is going to be mercuric acetate. But instead of using water, we're going to use an alcohol. And then the second step is going to be sodium borohydride. So for this one, we're going to use mercuric acetate. And what would be our alcohol in this case? Anybody? Could you name it? If I'm adding an ethyl group, that's going to come from which alcohol? Ethyl group comes from ethan, ethanol, exactly, it comes from ethanol. So it's gonna come from ethanol. And so we'll put ethanol in the first step. And then in the second step, we'll put eh, sodium borohydride. All right, what about the second one? Can anybody come up with a name for the alcohol in the second one? Did anybody come up? We went over alcohol nomenclature in chapter 12. Did anybody come up with a name for this alcohol? It's not butanol because it's 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 not linear. Right? If I there you go, if I had something linear like this, I could call that butanol, but this would be cyclo. Cyclobutanol, exactly. So it's going to be cyclobutanol. Okay, that's your first step. And then in the second step, it's going to be sodium borohydride, like that. All right. Next section acids can undergo acid promoted cleavage. So let's see here. Acid promoted cleavage. So uh, you can break an, uh, an ether apart. It takes a really strong acid to do it. Okay, very strong acids to break apart um, to break apart ethers. But yeah, if you hit it with a hard enough acid, what happens is that you're going to protonate the oxygen in the middle, and then it will render the alkyl groups electrophilic. So you can have a nucleophilic attack from the halide that's left over if you use something like HBr as your acid. So that'll give you an alkyl halide in an alcohol. And you guys know that if you take the alcohol and treat it with HX, well, it's going to give you the alkyl halide again. So you end up with two equivalents of an alkyl halide. So what you end up with products are two equivalents of an alkyl halide plus water. So to summarize, um, I, yeah, I don't have it on this slide. So I'll write it out here for you. What you have is ROR, okay? When you treat that with HX, what you end up with is Rx, Rx plus H2O, okay? So you end up with two moles of the alkyl halide, all right? So instead of writing it as Rx, Rx, that's not really proper for a chemist, you should put two times Rx, right? It's two moles of it. So for every one mole of ether, you get two moles of your alkyl halide. So the acids that you can use to do this Okay, it has to be either HBr or HCl. I'll scribble it over here. HX is equal to H, um, sorry, HBr or HI. Sorry, I misspoke, is HBr or HI. It can, so we'll put here HCl. Nope, not strong enough. So it has to be a hydrobromic acid or hydroiodic acid. And there's one more, uh, a couple more nuances. If your R group is tertiary, it's not going to break by an SN2. It's going to break by an SN1. And if you have an alkyl, aryl, or, or sorry, if you have an aryl or vinyl group, okay? So remember, aryl, this is aryl. Right here, a vinyl group would be this, okay? Substitution isn't going to occur, okay? So you're going to leave that part of the molecule intact. And you see that right here. The only side that breaks is the part that isn't aryl, okay? That comes off as an alkyl halide but the rest of it stays in the alcohol format, okay? So I would expect you to know this mechanism, the whole dang thing on here. It's just repeating over and over and over, right? 
proton transfer, SN2, proton transfer, SN2. So I would expect you to know that. All right, as far as auto oxidation goes, you don't really have to know auto oxidation. It occurs through a free radical mechanism. But one thing I'll tell you is that ethers um, have to be tested frequently. If you have ethers in a laboratory, you have to test them for peroxides every once in a while because if they do form a hydroperoxide, they become explosive and we generally frown upon explosions in the lab. All right, they might seem exciting. So again, I will not ask this mechanism. So will, eh, come on you, will not ask anything about auto, at least the auto oxidation mechanism, okay? You don't need to know that. But I will expect you to do problems like this one here. So for the first one, we have two alkyl groups here. So that means we're gonna break those alkyl groups off and they're gonna be converted into alkyl halides. So they're gonna be converted into an alkyl bromide. So we end up with two equivalents of the alkyl bromide plus water. In the second one, it's, it's a ring, but you can break both of those, right? So we have a total of one, two, three, four carbons. So we have one, two, three, four carbons and you end up with the halogen in this case, which is iodine on our, each side, plus water. And then in the last one, remember, you can break the side to the alkyl group to give you the alkyl, um, I'll use a black pen. So to give you the alkyl bromide, but remember you cannot break this bond. So you also end up with the phenol in this case. All right, you end up with the phenol in that case. So that brings us to nomenclature of epoxides. All right. <laughs>